Major funding for the production of Roads to Recovery has been provided by Kenny Bunk Savings. You know, I grew up in Sportsman's Paradise is what they call it. So, you know, fishing everywhere, hunting everywhere. We use recreation and sport engagement uh, in a way to specifically um, help people achieve what it is that they want from life. The biggest challenge is just connecting with veterans um, and, and getting them through the door initially. In our series, Roads to Recovery, we explore the journeys people take to overcome substance misuse. Veterans are at risk for addiction with nationally 11% currently in treatment. We'll explore some of the reasons why the people who serve their country sometimes struggle once they return home. And we'll look at some of the programs that can help. Our story begins in Newington, New Hampshire, along the shore of Great Bay. What are you fishing for today? Striper. Striper season is winding down, and Ryan Nunley is gearing up for one last outing. So how do you fish for stripers? Um, there's so many different ways, topwater lures. Uh... Ryan is from Louisiana, born and raised there. It's also where fishing, it seems, is a birthright. Yeah, I was probably in a in a bassinet or whatever uh, out on the boat with my, my dad. Uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. The Army veteran moved to New Hampshire in 2015 from Colorado. His wife, a Bostonian, brought him here. I feel a lot more like at home here other than uh, when the snow starts flying. I'm ready to go back home at that point. <laughs> Ask Ryan about his military career and he'll tell you how it all began. 99. So I went to basic training in 99. Uh, I was in the National Guard to begin with. Uh, I went active duty in 2000, early 2003. I, I picked Colorado as my duty station thinking, you know, Colorado mountains, you know, everything's going to be great there. Then I didn't realize that they were going to deploy me as soon as I got there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as soon as I got there, I was off to Iraq. It's nothing you can be prepared for. I mean, you can train all you want, but you know, when somebody's actually shooting at you with real bullets, <laughs> it's uh, it's not a joke anymore. Does it change you at all? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't. I used to be a, a social person, but um, you know, I've I've got a couple friends I trust. As Ryan moved from military to civilian life, close friends seemed to disappear. The feeling of isolation was just one of the challenges Ryan faced. I had a couple uh, injuries on my back when in Iraq, plus the VA. I mean, they had me so addicted to so many pills that, you know, I was wired and awake all the time, you know. So. What were the pills for? Pain. Was it something that you struggled with then? The, the, the... I was definitely addicted. Um, you know, you, you take eight, ten Vicodin a day, uh, you're definitely addicted to them. <laughs> uh, best estimate they had for those v those veterans that are enrolled and participating in VA care, it hovers around 11% or so nationally. And according to the VA, about 20% of veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan live with post-traumatic stress disorder. The chief of mental health at the Manchester VA Medical Center says there are reasons for that. Veterans have a lot of life experiences and exposures that other populations or other groups of people might not have. 
you have a higher risk of substance use if you've had a combat deployment, if you um, have had long periods of separation from your family or support structure like veterans often do um, when they're in the military, or if you've had other interpersonal traumas which, which can happen as a part or during a period of military service. Uh, it was hard to get off of them, very hard. In 2005 when I got out, um, it was more, we're just going to treat everybody as a whole. You know, you've got people addicted so hard to painkillers and all of that, that, you know, you say, okay, we're stopping right now and we're going to start, well, you have people going through withdrawals now and suicide rates up. We've seen a huge culture shift across the medical field and how we look at the treatment of pain. And so that's gone hand in hand with how we look at um, substance use disorders. And so that, that I think has been a challenge for everybody. The good news is with that, once we became aware of the opioid issues, we have blossomed into a huge, um, we've blossomed a huge variety of services that are available to help folks through that process. Cut off from painkillers, Ryan turned to alcohol. You don't think of alcohol as a, a drug um, that you can get addicted to, but when you crave alcohol every day, all day, I mean, it's very much a drug. One night in early spring 2020, Ryan says his drinking ended abruptly. Went home from a friend's house, uh, had too much to drink. I think I fell asleep at the wheel. And I honestly could not tell you. I got knocked out uh, at the very beginning of it and pretty much woke up in the hospital. Ryan reached out to the VA. They connected him with a therapist. She introduced me to Northeast Passage. My biggest goal for a lot of our group activities is just to provide like a safe space to recreate. Northeast Passage is a program of the University of New Hampshire. Staff and university students work with people who live with a disability. Philip Brecky runs the recreation therapy program for veterans. It's great to, to you know, be able to to help out um, wherever people are kind of on their, on their journey of recovery or uh, just meeting people where they're at without any real judgment, just kind of diving in and, and seeing where, what you can do. We're, you know, we're different in that we're not like a recovery program, but we have been an important part of the picture of recovery for a lot of folks. We over time have had a lot of uh, veterans roll through the program. As part of our individual services, we have um, like a pre and post test evaluation that help guide the way that we're working together. And the outcomes for that sort of empirical data um, are uh, improved quality of life, um, more access to information and knowledge about the communities in which they live, greater ability to access those things confidently. And that's why we're at Great Bay. Northeast Passage is one of the VA's community partners. Did you end up having any luck at Old Orchard? They set up Ryan with fishing gear and a kayak. There's something about um, walking down the trail or kayaking or fishing or biking or whatever it is that you're doing with people alongside people. Um, that is very non-threatening, I think, and there isn't an awful lot of stigma associated with it because this is what people do, right? Like, they engage in the world. So what time is high tide? Because I think people in their journeys get a real solid sense of like, okay, these are the patterns that I have to stop. This is the thing that I have to not do. I, I can't go here because that would be, you know, triggering it, like all of the things and they, they kind of get it dialed in and they're, you know, it's hard work, right? And if it's all just about this hard work of holding back, you know, 
like there needs to be joy in life, right? You need to create the life that you want to live and, and recreation and the ways that we engage with other people and in our communities is so vital to that. They were a lifesaver for me. It was just being bored all the time, not knowing anybody, it's kind of hard. Just, I live in Greenfield, New Hampshire, so it's a good hour and a half drive to come to the Great Bay. I met a guy there, uh, Sammy, that him and his wife and kids were, I mean, our lives were almost identical at the same age, you know, and, you know, they met in the military, our sons are around at the same age, and, you know, we hit it off pretty good, so. Ryan, that's, that's how I met him. I met him through this program. Um, you know, he's an Army vet. Uh, I'm an Army vet. So we didn't know each other because he's from Louisiana. I'm from California and we became friends here in New Hampshire. You know, there's so much training, 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 training to get you ready for your role in the military, but there's not a ton of training to get you to civilian life. And you, a lot of people kind of lose that piece of themselves, that identity once they're transitioning to civilian life. And, you know, we're trying to just help um, fill some of that with maybe it is you can start identifying as you know uh, an artist a hiker a cyclist an angler it's relaxing um it's it's a, almost like a mindfulness uh practice because i'm not thinking about anything else but me my my fishing rod and the fish so it's it's calming um it's therapeutic Recreational therapy is just another uh, opportunity for an individual to uh, reconnect, you know, to come back into the world. They're coming back from over there, back here. Uh, if they uh, aren't able to uh, reintegrate for some reason, then having a, a, a rec, good rec therapy program can be absolutely key. The biggest challenge is just connecting with veterans um, and, and getting them through the door initially. And, and that, if you have one veteran telling another veteran to do something, that's like gold. There's sometimes almost like a, a guilt in the veteran community of like, I don't deserve these services. There's always someone who needs it more. Um, go help the next person sort of mentality because that's that's the military culture but the idea of time and you put this time in you did this service for for our country as a whole and now it's your turn to to take this time for yourself this probably doesn't sound too good but overvalorization gets to the point where it stops them from understanding that they're human as well when people are, you know, always thank them for their service and you're a hero, this, that, and the other, um, it makes them feel like if they say, hey, I'm not really a superhero, uh, I need, I actually may need help on this, it can, it can actually be more harmful than good. And I think that, that happens a lot, right? And I, I think from my perspective, I grew up watching that. When we first met Eric Golnick, he was with a companion. This dog, Samson, has saved my life. When I get panic attacks or stressed out, he's there for me. Eric grew up in a military family. From a standpoint of growing up, that was, that's what we grew up to be, right? It's, uh, it's something that we always thought service was so important. He served in the Navy and became an officer. After four years in the reserves and four years active duty, Eric retired. Then he went back to school. Because, I, of course, I was a, a tough guy. Um, I never thought I had any issues when I got out of the military. I thought this was going to be great. Next chapter, I'm going to go and, and get my master's degree and, and, and move on. Um, what I didn't realize is a lot of the things, once you don't have that structured lifestyle when you get out of the military, um, is you, you lose that, that sense of purpose and you lose the structure and then some negative thoughts can creep in. You could start thinking about traumatic events that happened. Um, and I went from, you know, being a naval officer to 
living in a one bedroom apartment in Miami, getting my master's degree and drinking a bottle of whiskey a day. Social isolation is a huge impact for folks. Um, we know that veterans are humans and humans thrive on connection. Veterans have done really well and really appreciate the value of having a group, of having an identity, of having um, a mission that comes with, you know, being involved in um, a certain community or a certain group. And so when you lose that, that becomes really tough. You lose your mission, you lose your support, you lose your squad. It took a while for Eric to realize he couldn't go it alone. A colonel recognized the trouble he faced and strongly suggested he find help. So I went to my first psychiatrist and uh, there's a thing called cultural competence that I think is so important, right? It's understanding. So the, the psychiatrist goes, oh, okay, yeah, so um, I guess when you, when you murdered people in the military, um, you're having all these issues. And I you know, murdered people, what, what, what are you talking, what? You know, I, I was a ship driver, what are you even talking about? Um, but it was that, it was his lack of understanding of how that military culture piece is, right? Um, so for me, finding somebody that understood the military and understood where I was coming from and kind of got, that's where I finally started getting help and, and was doing good. And I think that is, um, in some ways, the, from my perspective, kind of the essence of what we need to bring into our work, no matter who we're working with. And very much so with veterans, whose experience is um, unique in the sense that it's different than the non-veteran population, but also is unique to every one of them. Eric found help and is sober. He and another veteran saw the need to help others and created VFR Healthcare. They partner with the VA in Northeast Passage, serving veterans, their families, and first responders. A lot of times you're not gonna have substance use by itself, right? There's always gonna be some kind of mental health issue behind it. And what we focus on is trauma. Especially in this population with veterans, trauma is, is a main focus of our clinical team. When they, when they look at this stuff. And uh, we do it, uh, what they call intensive outpatient treatment. So it's, it's um, three hours, three times per week, um, and outpatient as well. But the point is, we're, we're only filling a very small piece of the puzzle, but we can help kind of help uh, be what you would call in the military a force multiplier, right? To be able to help folks at a larger scale and help fill gaps so people don't fall through the cracks. The VA provides a variety of services for veterans, talk therapy, medication-assisted treatment, and bees. Out behind the Manchester VA Medical Center are hives. Veterans suit up. <laughs> They get smokers stoked and then move in. I'm a beekeeper, that's my profession. And it is Karen Eaton's passion. She helped bring bees to the VA, a bit by accident. My husband came down with Parkinson's and he is a veteran and we started coming to the VA to take advantage of all the wonderful programs they have here. When she got to know the staff, she made them an offer. I decided I would propose that they have some hives here to benefit the veterans. Veterans going through therapy do it all. They learn about bees, they care for them, and if the season is good, there's honey to build a team and to have a function rather than just coming and doing an activity for an hour, they are involved. They read, they study. We have education in the winter time. We have hands-on in the summer, in the spring, in the fall. I couldn't enjoy it more. Um, this wasn't my first trip to the hives. I was here a couple weeks ago, uh, me and another veteran. Um, and the first thing I thought when I put the suit on and went over there and we started opening up was the, uh, I thought they were kidding, but you really do feel the sense of peace with the bees. You sit in the middle of a maelstrom of, of bees and they don't care about you. And it's just, 
You hear them. It's been, it's been very peaceful. The COVID-19 pandemic has moved a lot of the VA's therapy sessions online. Air Force veteran Thomas Scott still likes to get out to the hives. My recovery had, had only dealt with my doctors, who, whereas they're wonderful, aren't on the personal level, I guess. Um, and then I had counselors through the years, um, and they seemed to be enough at the time, you know? Um, but now, with COVID, this has actually taken the place for me uh, instead of having to go to someone's office and talk to them because I can't do that right now anyway. I didn't expect this amount of relief. For almost 40 years, Vince Littolo served his country. The Army veteran has lived with post-traumatic stress. Beekeeping hasn't erased the struggle, but it has made it a lot easier to live with. Um, I actually stopped a lot of my meds so I don't do those anymore. And I'm actually able to just relax, chill out, because I'm in the now, I'm in the moment of today, now, because uh, I'm thinking about the bees all the time. In fact, I love this so much, I actually started two beehives myself. I've had a number of veterans tell me that they are able to take the calmness and that sense of relaxation that they feel when they're in the hives with them throughout the rest of their day, that that carries over for them. The beekeeping program attracts between 10 to 15 veterans twice a week. VA rec therapist Valerie Carter works alongside them. A lot of people in recovery will have problems finding meaningful leisure in their day, finding things that are gonna keep them like engaged to change and replace some of those leisure activities that were not so healthy for them, whether it's spending time at the bar, whether it's spending time with people who were using substances. And so finding a meaningful leisure activity, such as beekeeping, can help replace those less productive leisure activities. Stumbling upon the beekeeping program and the other rec therapy programs gave me a purpose, gave me a reason to get up earlier in the day than say nine or 10. Something to where I can make a difference, but also help other vets. I mean, that's I think where I've ended up now is if we can attract, attract more vets to the programs and just one person has a good day because of it, then I think that's a pretty solid purpose. And then how do we help engage everybody else? How do I make somebody feel comfortable when they're out at the hives with me? How, what can I teach? So as people start to get in more education and more leadership, what kind of roles can we ha they have in teaching others um, and kind of and branching it out that way? Any veteran who's lonely, uh, any veteran who thinks that they don't have people to talk to, this program is in every state. Um, they don't all do beekeeping, but we're trying to fix that. Uh, but there are a variety of programs that help you when you have no one else to turn to, no one else to talk to. And I don't have to turn or talk to any of these guys, but I can come with them and I know that they know that some days are a struggle and other days aren't. And uh, I just, any vet that, that needs that should, should reach out because I guarantee there's at least one program in rec therapy for them. It actually helps me dramatically because I'm actually, when I get into my down thought process, I actually start thinking about the bees. Uh, what do I got to do next? Then I get online, that's like, okay, now I see that. You know, it just helps me process things. So I'm not thinking of just about me anymore. I actually turn it around to what does the bees need? What do I need to do to help them? Look at them all to your left. Back on Great Bay, Ryan finds what he came looking for. There we go. Fishing's just, uh, I don't know, it, I guess it's my, my zen place. You know, just, I don't have a care in the world out here right now. You know, you leave everything at the boat dock or boat ramp and even if you don't catch anything, it's still, a day out on the water. I was gonna kiss the first one. <laughs> I 
I mean, I think ultimately the goal of treatment is to help people kind of really reconnect with what's important to them, what their values are, and to move in the direction of those values, taking their anxiety and everything else along with them, um, rather than thinking I've got to somehow get rid of it first. Well, I'm going to go try to catch more fish. Yeah. I think that idea of hope is real important, right? So like, there is more to me than this point of struggle, right? Like we all have points of struggle in life, but like if I have more to my story than just walking around in my difficulties, right? If I have more stories to share with my friends and to tell about who I am in this world and what's important to me, right? Then my world gets bigger and bigger and bigger. The families of veterans can experience the effects of stress while and after their loved ones are deployed. There are programs available for them, too. For more information about how to access support services, go to nhpbs.org recovery. I'm Jennifer Rooks. Thanks for watching Roads to Recovery. Major funding for the production of Roads to Recovery has been provided by Kenny Bunk Savings.